our streets. Occupy Wall Street erupted as a protest movement in New York's financial district. The whole world is watching. Activists took to the streets, speaking out against economic inequality. Look how strong we are. The movement quickly spread to 82 countries around the globe, pitting the so-called 99% against the wealthy 1%. But back in New York, authorities eventually moved in and shut things down. Rest going on just in behind me as we speak. Traffic really just mayhem down in the financial district. At its core, Occupy is considered an American phenomenon. This is what democracy looks like. But those seeds of discontent were first planted in Canada. The very first Occupy Wall Street tweet sent out in July 2011 came from the account of Canadian magazine Adbusters. The man behind that tweet was Micah White, who used to work at Adbusters. Today, White has a different view on the movement. He says protest is broken and mass marches no longer work. And he's got some radical ideas on what will bring about real change. He's written all about it in his new book, The End of Protest, a new playbook for revolution. I sat down with Micah White earlier in Toronto. Micah, so nice to meet you. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for coming to Canada. It's my pleasure. You know, I think a lot of people don't know that uh, the Occupy movement has its roots here with a Canadian magazine, Adbusters, that you're associated with. Yeah. What is it about Canada that and is, Occupy? That is such a good question. I mean, there is something magical about Canada because, you know, Adbusters is a Canadian magazine based in Vancouver. It's an anti-consumerist magazine. And at the time, I was an editor there. And that's where the core idea for Occupy Wall Street came from, is that Kala, the founder of Adbusters, and I were kind of brainstorming how can we bring the revolutionary moment to America. But it was almost a secret, right, that Adbusters was behind it. You wanted people to carry on. But you, there was originally a goal. Mm. There was, like, one purpose. Mm. Because Occupy has since been attacked for not having a, a clear message. But there was one in the beginning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, basically, you know, what happens if you go back to that magical time of 2011? Adbusters, at the time, we said, and that one demand should be to get money out of politics. But of course, the very nature of Occupy Wall Street is that we gave it to the participants and we said this is a leaderless movement. And so the participants themselves had to come up with the one demand. And, and very quickly, we saw that those consensus-based decision-making tactics weren't up to the task of creating a one demand. But I think still, the overall, the movement was about getting money out of politics. And, and that was something that we all kind of knew. Um, but yeah, it wasn't articulated any as clearly. And now you've written this book that says almost that Occupy was a failure. Well, I think that Occupy... Not a complete failure, but... Right, exactly. I think that Occupy was a constructive failure. It wasn't a total failure. Occupy did achieve a lot of beautiful things. It trained a new generation of activists. It changed the way we talk about income inequality. It, you know, launched new movements like Black Lives Matter and this kind of stuff. So it wasn't a total failure, but it was a constructive failure in the sense that it did not achieve the goal that it set out to achieve. It did not get money out of politics. It did not overthrow the rule of the 99... of the, the 1%, you know? The 99% no, no, have, have no greater political power than they did when we started the movement. And so it was constructive because it taught us something very important about activism. It taught us that the theory of social change that's been underpinning contemporary activism isn't true. And that even if you create a mass movement like Occupy Wall Street, it doesn't get the, the kind of change that you want. So activists need to innovate and kind of um, get a little bit more sophisticated about how we think about social change. What do you think about the Black Lives Movement? Is that, is that a successful protest? Yeah, I mean, this is, one, this is one of the touchy areas. Of course, I'm black, so I totally support Black Lives Matter. But if I could give it like, you know, some friendly, friendly criticism as an activist, I do think that the Black Lives Matter learned the wrong lesson from the failure of Occupy Wall Street. If I can't breathe, you can't breathe. It seems to me that the lesson that they, that they think they've learned, which is that Occupy failed because it wasn't disruptive enough. And so we need to block more traffic. We need to block more events. Black Lives Matter. But Occupy didn't fail because we weren't disruptive enough. We did plenty of disruption. Instead, Occupy failed because we weren't able to kind of gain sovereignty, you know? And I think for Black Lives Matter, the next step would be, if we want to stop police from killing black people, then we need to become the force that controls the police, that appoints the police, that is the police. And this, I think, is a kind of broader, broader horizon of possibility. You're pretty critical of the, the old ways of, of, of protest, of marches even. They're saying like the, the huge climate march, right. that you distrust it, that right. you don't trust online petitions. Right. So are you like 
not very popular in the activist community. No, I think that that is actually really true. I think that for, I do think that it's that I've become kind of unpopular in the activist community because there's this kind of desire among activists. They like to tell one story, which is nothing's ever a failure. We're actually winning. Um, you know, we're doing great. And this this feels really good when people say this to themselves, but it doesn't help us learn anything. People have been marching in the streets for a thousand years. You, you say it doesn't work anymore? Right. Don't yeah. march? Don't, don't protest? <laughs> no, d not don't protest, but just protest differently. It's beholden on activists and everyday people to kind of to see that we're in one of those moments where protest isn't working and to break out of it. You know, we can't stay here. We can't, we can't stay in a, in, a, in a time when we just kind of go through the rituals of marching and stuff like this, even though we really know that it's not going to do what we want. One of the things that's really taken off in the last few years is online petitions, everybody signing on. Right. You don't like them either. <laughs> well, I think online petitions, you know, there's a real danger around online petitions, which is first, everyone knows it's, it's basically the most easiest gesture you could possibly do. But there's actually something that I think is even more insidious, which is that online petitions, they, it's kind of activism where people, they don't trust their instincts anymore. Instead, what they do is if you look at the big groups like Avaz, they send out like a tester email to a thousand people. And then if a certain percentage of those people open the email and then they click the email and then sign the petition, well, then that email gets sent to everyone. But you know, that kind of market testing of revolutionary ideas just simply doesn't work. And if we had sent out an email before Occupy Wall Street being like, hey, everyone, do you think this is a good idea? Okay, click on this link and sign this petition. Frankly, it would not have flown. It would not have gone anywhere. But people feel they're doing something good. Yeah, it makes us feel better. Just like going on marches makes us feel better. Um, but it's, the, you know, that kind of, we need a revolution now more than ever. We, there, we face global challenges and we need a global social movement in order to address these challenges. And so it's, it's, it's dangerous to, to continue to use tactics that aren't effective because we don't, what we don't want is for people to lose hope in, in, in the possibility of protests entirely because then they become more violent. So not marches, not petitions, so, so what? I think that the core thing to realize is that, you know, if you go back to 2011 and you see what happened in Spain, which is that they mobilized in their squares and there was an election at that time and they said, we're not going to engage in the election, you don't represent us, and what happened? The right wing swept into power. So now fast forward to 2016, what's going on in Spain? Those same activists have launched a political party. They've launched a social movement that's actually winning elections. It's called Podemos. That's really the future of revolutions. North Americans need to look and see what's happened there and see that we need to build social movements that can win power, which means being able to swing elections, hack elections. One way of hack elections? Hack elections. You know, one way of thinking about it is Occupy Wall Street started on September 17th, and basically we were evicted on November 15th. But in America, our elections are around November 4th or 5th. So had there been an election that year with Occupy Wall Street raging in the squares, we would have swung things. I think I can imagine the, the birth of a social movement that, that arises very quickly, maybe 60 days before an election, in order to dramatically influence it, and then goes to the next country that's having an election and influences that one in order to win elections in multiple countries in order to carry out a unified geopolitical agenda. So instead of influencing politicians, you're becoming politicians? Exactly, yeah. One of the reasons why people- Are you gonna run for office? I don't know, I don't think that, <laughs> I think that it's more like, it's more about cultivating leaders from within the movement upwards, you know, rather than putting our hopes again in someone like Donald Trump or, yeah, you well, know, what Bernie do you think Sanders. I mean, is he a, he's a bit of a revolutionary. I he's do. inspired a lot of angry people. Yeah, yeah, I do think that Donald Trump and, and both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are symptomatic of the fact that people in America are desperate for social change. They're desperate at the same time as they understand that protest in the old models isn't working. So is he, a good example of protest? I think he's a regression. I think he's a regression back to putting our hopes in these singular individuals. I think that instead what we really need to do is put our hopes in decentralized social movements where the people themselves will come into power. But you know, I do think that one thing I appreciate about Donald Trump is his risk it all attitude. I think if you contrast Donald Trump with Bernie Sanders, you know when Donald Trump says, if I don't get the nomination, I'm, there's gonna be riots and protests in the streets. That's exactly what Bernie Sanders should have been saying two months ago. He should have said, you know what, I'm not gonna engage in this, in this Democrat, this primary farce. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna call for protests on the Occupy anniversary, September 17th, which is right around the election. We're gonna win this election with people power in the streets and I'm gonna be, you know, but he doesn't have the kind of, I, I would say the risk it all guts that, that Donald Trump has, so. And you admire that? I do think that we need more of that risk it all attitude. I mean, if, if you know, Cullah and Adbusters, we had that. That's why Occupy happened. So I think activists have become kind of, um, a lot of activism has become social marketing. You know, we play it safe. 
we're just out there to get our ideas into large, you know, we're, whereas what we need to do is, is remember like, no, we're playing for power. We could actually gain power like they're doing in Spain and Italy and other countries that have used social movements to win elections. The people, the 99% could really be governing the world in our lifetimes. That's the kind of like grand vision that we're heading towards. It's a really interesting book. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, yeah.